Yeah, we're ready to go. Okay, uh, we can start. Can we start? Yes. Yes. All right. Uh, we were we were revising through Sri Lanka, and uh, we were talking about Protestant Buddhism in Sri Lanka. And then uh, we have the next topic uh, is to talk about the contribution of uh, Colonel Accord. So who's going to share with us now? And the next one will be Anagarik Padamapala. The contribution of Colonel Ocott. Number 20, 20. Would that be okay if I just read off the bullet points? All right. If, uh, if you would like to attempt, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> Henry Steele Olcott, the co founder of the Theosophical Society, came to Sri Lanka on 17 May 1880. With his arrival, the activities of the Reformation gained traction. 19th May, he formally became a Buddhist. Okada proposed the establishment of the Buddhist school through his uh, Buddhist Theosophical Society. What he did was in 1880, there were three schools um, established and 1897, 25 boys schools, uh, 11 girls school, and 10 mixed one, co-ed ones. In 1903, 174 schools with about 30,000 students. And in 1940, 429 schools. So for the Buddhist Theosophical Society started at the Sinhala newspaper. I don't even know how to read this word. Sarasavasi Sandarasa in December 1880. And later, its English supplement, the Buddhist, now a monthly of the YMVA, Colombo. As a result of um, his effort, Buddhists of Lanka gained freedom to hold their Buddhist processions and that the full moon day of Vasaka was declared a public holiday in 1885. Um, and then they get to have their own Buddhist flag and the, uh, with the appointment of the Buddhist registrars of the marriages. So that's all I could get from the uh, class notes. Okay, thank you so much. Uh... I'd like to go on to Anagarika Dhammapada. Uh, it's better for you to share because uh, all the revision topics are the topics that uh, are important. Anyone would like to share on Anagarika Dhammapada? I can read some. Um, Anagarika Dhammapala's major contribution to the Buddhist reformation are the restoration to Buddhist control of the Mahabodhi temple at Bodhi Gaya. Dhammapala initiated a lawsuit against the Brahmin priest who, held, who had held control of the site for centuries after a protracted struggle. This was successful only after Indian independence in 1947 and 16 years after Dhammapala's own death in 1933, 
with the partial restoration of the site to the management of the Mahabodhi Society in 1949. The restoration of Sanath, the temple in Sanath, and then um, internalized Buddhist movement. He visited England four times. And well, the China, Japan, and Thailand, US six times, and France and Italy en route on his journey to England and America. During, during his visits to England and America, he secured valuable financial support and established a Buddhist center in London in 1926. One of Dhammapala's successor, G. Malasekara, one of the founder of World Foundation Buddhist, he, oh, World Fellowship Buddhism. He was also a revivalist, um, revivalist leader. This is a Dhammapala's successor. Dhammapalas conducted or enabled a mass conversion of Dalits, which is earlier than uh, Mbaka by 50 years. Popularized Buddhist education, not only locally, but also internationally. And he bring cultural pride back to the Sinhalese, led foundation for Buddhist nationalism. This is Ambeka. No, this is Dhammapala stuff yeah. that he did. Mm -hmm. Okay, all. these are the uh, contributions of Anagarika Dhammapala. Yes. Uh, when we talk about Buddhism in Sri Lanka, especially in recent times, we can't miss these two great personalities, Colonel of Court and Anagarika Pala. But we should also remember the role played by the, the Piridina. That was uh, that were established uh, even earlier than uh, than the Dhammapala, right? earlier than the arrival of Colonel uh, Accord, because uh, this uh, this Piridina also uh, produced many great uh, scholars, uh, which eventually also had great influence on uh, Sri Lankan Buddhism. For example, Reverend Dr. Rahula here. So a product of the Prevena and then the very notable uh, K. Sri Damananda, uh, the chief uh, level in Malaysia and Singapore, my teacher, uh, they were also product from the Prevena. So in your revision, you should also look at the Prevena, the roles played by the various uh, Prevenas. Okay. Okay, next, uh, we will go on to the next item. Uh, we go on to the next item to talk about uh, Myanmar. Anybody would like to talk about uh, Myanmar? I thought the next question was Dr. M. Dekar and bringing the Buddhist revival to India. Oh, sorry, uh, Dr. Yeah. Baker, I, 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 I got I, that I'm one. Too fast. <laughs> uh, I was going too fast. We should be at uh, India. Yeah, we're on number 22. All right. Um, Dr. Um, Bedkar, uh, his role in bringing a, a, a Buddhist to revival in India. He, uh, he tried to prove... Uh, the Untouchables were Buddhists in his 1948 thesis on the origin of untouchability. He made it clear that the Untouchables were once Buddhists. Uh, the Untouchables, who were they and why they became Untouchables? Buddhism was an Indian re religion and the Buddha was uh, closer uh, to the Untouchable masses. The untouchables would join with um, the world Buddhist community and thus pave the way for a world brotherhood. Ambedkar's approach was to um, call for uh, agitation, education, and organization, um, primarily uh, nonviolent. It was um, 
No, um, uh, and he was uh, responsible for our, um, a, a very um, prominent uh, factor in the conversion of many of the Dalits uh, uh, to, Buddha, to Buddhism in India. And um, you can see from uh, our figures uh, from 1951 to 1981 uh, that uh, the uh, the uh, Buddhists um, in India, uh, you know, mainly Dalits. I guess we had some. There were there were some mass conversions of of, of Dalits, but um, I guess others as well. But he had 180,000 and some in in uh, 1951. And in eight, by 81, over 4 million. Um, let's see. An important outcome of uh, Ambedkar's Buddhism was um, that, he, well, he pointed out that, that Buddhism uh, can help alleviate the immediate social sufferings of human beings. And uh, th this is testimony to what socially engaged Buddhism can do right here and now to reduce the suffering of humanity. That's all I have. So I was going to add that more. <laughs> I was going to add a, a couple of things about him because I, I find him kind of fascinating and I, I won't say contradictory to things that we've talked about, but he had a, a really long political career before um, getting really into Buddhism in the 50s. Uh, yeah. And he also was married twice. I mean, his first wife died. But uh, yeah, he was married in, in the, uh, pretty heavily into politics. Uh, and then in like what, 58, 54? I can't remember. I'm pulling the numbers out of my head. Um, is when he actually took the precepts and the, uh, the vows, uh, right, precepts. And, but yeah, it, it was kind of fascinating because the subject comes up a lot that whether Buddhists should be involved in politics. And you know, he was he was pretty heavily involved from the 30s on in politics. So I, I, I find him kind of fascinating to read on. And here we go. He established, <laughs> he established uh, the uh, uh, Humanistic and Science College in 46, Siddhartha, and um, the Siddhartha Humanistic and Science College. 1950 um, went to the um, well. That was um, the World of uh, uh, Federation of uh, what's that? WFB again? The World Federation of Buddhas Conference in Colombo. Uh, 51 published the the hymn book Buddha Upasana Pasna Pata, and uh, later that year writing. Uh, his um, Buddha and his Dharma. Yeah, I did not. I did notice. Uh, I I did do a little. Uh, he he was He had he had a number of uh, um, positions in in. Uh, if I if I'm not getting my people mixed up, positions in government. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I didn't write that down since I thought that was sort of uh, on a tangent. <laughs> I just brought it up because, like I said, the, the question. Yeah, of, we can also. Oh, go ahead. It's fine. The, the question intended to ask the uh, Anakara contribution to Buddhism. But of course, uh, we cannot ignore the fact that uh, he was a politician in the first place. He was the minister of law, actually, and uh, he was tasked with the. Uh, uh, drafting the first constitution of the of the, the of India of the new the new Republic of India, so he was uh, he was actively involved in politics, and uh, his involvement in the, in Buddhism was, if you examine carefully, uh, was primarily uh, motivated by his desire to get uh, the Dalits out of their problem, and that is by uh, resorting to getting out of Hinduism, and therefore they have to look for a new religion. Therefore, in this particular case, he found uh, Buddhism uh, the most uh, uh, most uh, suitable, adequate, and uh, uh, most uh, suitable 
vehicle for him to bring the people out of their problem. So he was a politician in the first place, and then he turned to Buddhism because he needed a religion to resolve his, his problems or the, the problem of his people. So of course, uh, if possible, we also want to measure that to measure uh, to mention that uh, he was heavily involved in politics. And in fact, uh, he, he, he often quarrelled with Gandhi. And it's something that I find it quite, uh, quite difficult to understand also because uh, he, he was asking for a, a different electorate for the, the Dalits, meaning to say the Dalits would have a special electorate of their own. Uh, whereas uh, if this was done, then the Muslim would also ask the same thing then the whole of uh, India would be broken up. And that's what the, the Mahatma Gandhi refused to accept. And, uh, and because of that, Mahatma Gandhi went, went on a fast and uh, eventually uh, uh, Dr. Ambedkar relented and uh, gave in to Mahatma Gandhi. And there was no uh, separate electorate for the, for the Dalits. But, uh, you, uh, but if, I mean, if, I'm, if I were in his position, I also take it's difficult to, to say that you want to have a different electorate because in that case you are actually you are actually uh, reinforcing the caste system to already admit that there is a caste and this part caste needs to be specially protected and in fact in the, the Indian way now we also find it very difficult to understand that uh, they have in their constitution so-called scheduled caste and the scheduled caste would uh, uh, enjoy certain uh, certain uh, privileges uh, given to them. So, but but the term schedule caste, you are actually reinforcing the whole concept of, of caste. So this is a little bit paradoxical, but uh, perhaps the, the circumstances at that time there were actually no other choice. The, the caste was already there. Okay, anybody else to do that and internet problem? No. Sorry, you broke up a little bit, but I we didn't hear what you yeah, said. To speak. I'm gonna guess you asked if somebody wanted to speak on the next question. Uh, you're you're breaking up a little bit, so. Yeah. Okay. Did anybody have number twenty-three? Corey, how about you read? That's fine. So uh, discuss the role of Yuvasara and Yu Adama in his anti-colonial activities. So Venerable Yuvasara was from 24, 1889 to 19 September of 1929. And he died in prison after a 166 day hunger strike uh, against the British rule in Burma. Uh, he first was in prison in 1926 and he was sentenced to prison for a year of nine months. Uh, for making an illegal speech in uh, Tharwade uh, district. Uh, at the prison, authorities had ordered him to take off the Buddhist monk robes uh, and wear an inmate uniform instead, uh, and he uh, refused. So because Indian prison guards would not disrobe him, uh, British officers instead did. Uh, the, the monk went on for a hunger strike, refusing to take any food or drink. Uh, until he was allowed to wear the robe. Prison officials repeatedly tortured him throughout this, uh, but he did not give in to their demands. So 40 days into the strike, uh, prison officials finally uh, allowed him to wear his robes again. And they transformed him, uh, transferred him to prison in uh, Minnapur, uh, in West Bengal where he was released uh, on 29th of February in 1929. Uh, he then stayed in prison a second time uh, where his independence was short-lived and he was promptly rejoined uh, by the political scene. 
and he was arrested again for making an anti-colonist or colonialist uh, speech at a village near Thangwa, uh, which is present day Yangon region. Uh, he was sentenced to six years in prison then for inciting sedition. And a replay of his first prison stay, he was forcibly disrobed and the monk again went on a hunger strike uh, on the 6th of April, 1929. And this time, uh, and he tested the will of the prison officials and did not relent to disrobe. And uh, it increased the attention as the strike went on. Over four months into the strike uh, in August, a few senior monks were allowed to see him in the prison uh, where repeated conditions that he would take milk if he was allowed to wear his robes and food if he was allowed to fast on Sabbath days and that he was prepared to die for his cause. Uh, the, where the British officials were unmoved with, by this though. He died 166 days into his hunger strike and at, uh, the prison officials secretly dropped off the monk's body uh, the next day at the monastery. And the news of his death uh, shook the country. Uh, there was an outpouring of public support for what he stood for. He was given a martyr's cremation and burial in the public square. Uh, and it's previously unknown, the previously unknown monk's uh, ultimate sacrifice profoundly moved many Burmese who were not concerned themselves with politic politics before. Uh, he became a martyr of the independence movement. Uh, Sayada Arama, uh, it was, he lived from December of 1879 to September of 1939. And upon his return to British Burma, he started his political activities and toured the country lecturing uh, for the Young Men's Buddhist Association and giving an anti-colonial speeches. In 1921, he was arrested for his uh, Craddock get out speech against the Craddock scheme for Sir Reginald Craddock uh, who was then the governor of British Burma. Repeatedly imprisoned over his time on charges of sedition, he carried on. Uh, Adama was one of the first monks to enter the political arena and the first person in British Burma to be imprisoned as a result of making a political speech, followed by a long line of nationalists. So, uh, Adama is seen in both the as the first true martyr of Burmese nationalism and the father of modern Arcanese national movement. And that is all. Dado, your mic is muted. Hello. Oh, okay. I, I was I muted myself just now. No, okay. <laughs> can, can you hear can we now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you notice that uh, both uh, Otama and Visara, they were engaged with the uh, British, uh, engaged in uh, anti-colonial rule uh, way before Second World War. You know, the time when he died was 1939, the other fellow was died in 1939. This was just immediately after the First World War. So you, you, you will notice that uh, actually the Burmese uh, uh, so-called engaged Buddhist activities started um, much earlier than uh, many other countries, which happened uh, either during the Second World War or after the Second World War. But uh, that is also an indication that uh, some of these monks who were educated, well educated at that time and they traveled quite widely. For example, this Otama traveled to India, France and Egypt. So they were, they were exposed to the international politics quite early. So these well educated monks uh, took the lead. And sometimes we have to understand that in, in the colonial rule countries, 
this the monks are the one are the one who were well educated and therefore they took the lead. Whereas the general populations who do not uh, who did not uh, receive proper education uh, and are not aware of the political scenario, uh, they were not so bothered about the the colonial rules. So in a way, uh, it was the education and the exposure to international politics uh, that uh, make them uh, became uh, very much uh, socially engaged. So this is the same thing also for the Muslims, for example, in my country. Around this period, there were already a lot of Muslim scholars who traveled to Egypt, study in Egypt. And they were the one who, they, are, they, were, they were the one who came back and uh, established uh, these uh, religious uh, schools uh, for the children and uh, educating the children. And uh, they provided the groundwork for, uh, for eventually developing some of the leaders that uh, fought for independence after World War II. So, okay, this is this is a scenario in the in Burma. Shall we go on? The next one. All right. Okay. Topic number 24 is a very important topic because when we topic number 24, where we talk about the doctrinal basis of socially engaged Buddhism, as proposed by Dr. David Lloyd. Now, uh, although socially engaged Buddhism emerged as a movement uh, that cut across the sex and the, and the political boundaries uh, in, in, in about the year 1950s, uh, there, was, there was at that time uh, no doctrinal basis for, for this uh, socially engaged Buddhism. People were just involved and uh, if you were to ask them why they were involved, some of them might not be able to tell you on what on what doctrinal basis that supported them to be using the the label of Buddhism to be involved in this kind of social activities. So uh, later scholars uh, like uh, uh, Queens and Kings uh, of the USA and Dr. David Lloyd of uh, USA also. Uh, they try to uh, to give some uh, doctrinal basis, to propose some doctrinal basis of what is uh, socially engaged Buddhism uh, all about and why it is called socially engaged Buddhism, or why why should it be uh, Buddhist, or, or in what way it is Buddhist. So uh, this uh, Dr. David Lloyd uh, proposed. Uh, 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 a discussion, uh, a treatise on uh, or a doctrinal basis of uh, socially engaged Buddhism. So I would like uh, someone, someone to talk about this topic. It may be a bit lengthy. Uh, well, it's 13 pages. And by the way, you can always Google uh, Dr. David Loy, socially engaged Buddhism. You will be able to find this full article yep. about I think, 20 pages or so in the, in the internet. So please go ahead, please. Yeah, I think it's uh, zenoccidental.net. What is Buddhism about socially engaged Buddhism? What's Buddhist yeah. about socially engaged Buddhism by uh, David R. Loy? That's, yeah, you can bring it up pretty easily. It's quite long article. Mm -hmm. Um. So he goes on to say, uh, well, is is it Buddhist to be compassionate uh, um, or is that just uh, a human response? What's so Buddhist about it? Um, but uh, the, uh, the, imp the importance is um, of our personal practice and the basis of um, Buddhist uh, practice is the obvious need to work on oneself as well as on the social system. Uh, if, we, if we don't transform our own greed, ill will, delusion, our efforts, if we, if we put forth any efforts to address uh, any institutional uh, reform 
they're they are likely to be those efforts are likely to be in vain until we first work on ourselves um a commitment to nonviolence um is uh, is it's inseparable from um you, you can't you can't have peace in society without having um some peace uh in yourself you can't you can't bring forward a peace in society without um, being able to achieve your own. Um, so you, there's an awakening together, a social engagement. It's not about sacrificing our own happiness to help others who are suffering. It's just, um, it's self, it's um, mutually reinforcing. Um, we join together to improve the situation for all of us. And uh, you can see that in the um, five precepts and in, um, I guess you could say, Thich Nhat Hanh's treatment or, or um, interpretation of the five precepts called the five mindfulness trainings, a reverence for life, uh, aware of the suffering caused by the destruction of life, be aware that uh, or commit yourself to convulse cultivating the insight of interbeing and compassion, learning ways to protect the lives of people, animals, plants, and many other things. I am determined not to kill, not to let others kill, not to support any act of killing in the world, in my thinking or in my way of life, seeing that harmful actions arise from anger, fear, greed, and intolerance, which in turn come from dualistic and discriminative thinking. I will cultivate openness, non-discrimination, non-attachment to views in order to transform violence, fanaticism, dogmatism in myself and in the world. And uh, two, true happiness, aware of the suffering caused by exploitation, social injustice, stealing and oppression. I am committed to practicing generosity in my thinking, speaking and acting determined not to steal, not to possess anything that should belong to others, will share my time, energy, and material resources with those who are in need. I practice looking deeply to see that the happiness and suffering of others, not separate from my own happiness and suffering, that true happiness is not possible without understanding and compassion, and that running after wealth, fame, power, sensual pleasures can bring as much suffering and despair. I am aware that happiness depends on mental attitude, not on external conditions. I can live happily in the present moment simply by remembering I already have more than enough conditions to be happy. I am committed to practicing right livelihood so that I can help reduce the suffering of living beings on earth and stop contributing to climate chaos. True love, aware of the suffering caused by sexual misconduct, I am committed to cultivating responsibility, learning ways to protect the safety and integrity of individual couples, families, and society. Knowing that sexual desire is not love and that sexuality, sexual activity motivated by craving always harms myself as well as others. I will do everything in my power to protect children from sexual abuse and, and to prevent couples and families from being broken by, sexually, by sexual misconduct. Seeing that body and mind are one, I am committed to learning appropriate ways to take care of my sexual energy and cultivating loving kindness, compassion, joy, and inclusiveness, which are four basic elements of true love. Loving speech and number four, loving speech and deep listening, aware of suffering caused by unmindful speech and the inability to listen to others. I am committed to cultivating loving speech and compassionate listening in order to receive, to relieve suffering and to promote reconciliation and peace in myself and among other people, ethnic and religious groups and nations. And 
I don't know. I've probably gone on a little bit more than I need to. <laughs> but number five, nourishment and healing. Uh, aware of suffering caused by unmindful consumption. I am committed to cultivating good health, both physical and mental, for myself, my family, and my society by practicing mindful eating, drinking, and consuming. Practice looking deeply into how I consume the four kinds of nutriments. Yeah, that's uh, the non-duality, yeah, as you have on the screen. I think that's that's a big part of it. They're not they're not separable. The society and the individual are not not so separate as we might think. That the um, the self uh, the mutual reinforcement that I talked about earlier. I I think that hits the high points. What did I miss? Hello. Yeah, Dada, you're muted again. If you're if you are speaking. Okay. okay. Uh, so uh, thank you. It was David, isn't it? Who was talking? Yep. Uh, okay. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, so this aspect of uh, this doctrinal aspect of uh, socially engaged Buddhism uh, is quite important because uh, if we are learning the subject on, of humanistic Buddhism, we have we must be able to, to present the doctrinal basis uh, of, of this subject matter. Uh, even today, within the Buddhist circle, there are still a lot of people who are arguing uh, why should we be socially engaged, especially in political matters. We Buddhists, our fundamental and immediate concern is for our self-liberation, to have mindfulness at the present moment, and why are we looking here and there on social issues? So, uh, Dr. Levitt started by saying that this is a kind of a, a duality concept where we separate between our self-development and the social issue. Social issue as two different uh, sphere of activities. Whereas in duality, in actual, in actual fact, these are one and the same thing. So he tried to, to make us understand that, that there is actually a non-duality between the personal and the social practice. And then from here on, he moves on to discuss uh, the, in, the, the subject matter of uh, from arising from this, uh, this uh, duality concept, then we are caught in the concept of self. I and you and we and others. So uh, this brings us to Dukkha. So from the duality he talked about, because of this duality concept, which is fundamentally a moha or a, a, a ignorance, then arises this false sense of self or we, and therefore arises social pro problem which we call Dukkha. And this dukkha is rooted in the three evil roots. Okay? And these three evil roots in the past uh, is usually associated with only human self, individuals. But today, uh, due to the modern society we are in today, they are institutionalized. So the three evil roots of uh, greed, hatred, and delusion, or loba, dosa, moha, they are all institutionalized. So for example, uh, big corporations talk about use a lot of promotion to entice us to buy, to consume, to generate greed. And if we are working for a big corporation, the big corporations uh, through its institutionalized uh, methodology would make us uh, go for profit and therefore we are caught in it. So this is how we, we are caught into the institutionalized uh, greed. And then same thing for e-will, for example, military complexes, uh, lobbying for or creating conflicts in many parts of the world so that they can sell their weapons and then the delusions and so on. These are all institutionalized. So realizing all these problems, 
then he moved on to the what what would be the solutions so just to talk about Dukkha is not good enough so we need to establish a dharmic society but how do you what is a dharmic society again this is a very difficult concept now because uh, exactly how Buddhist how a, a dharmic society should be is something that we still need to work out therefore his, his, his main concern was we should produce men and women of goodwill to play the role of bringing about this kind of uh, uh, society okay? and he suggested that at least there are few, just a few three important things that we can do so that we can become men and women of goodwill who can bring about a dynamic society and that is number one we must focus on our personal practice because this personal practice would help us to begin with transforming our own grief and hatred and delusion first before we try to address the institutionalized uh, grief, hatred and delusion and then a commitment to non-violence, peace in every step and then number three not to think that we are trying to solve people's problems we are actually have to, here to solve our own problem the dukkha is our own dukkha therefore we want to awaken together okay. and then he further suggested apart from these three to use the five precepts as a plan of action which uh, David has uh, elaborated quite well by incorporating uh, what Thich Nhat Hanh uh, has uh, reinterpreted the five precepts to be applicable on a societal level okay. so he proposed the five precepts as a fundamental plan of action and uh, therefore this is the big summary of uh, what uh, David Lloyd proposed so by understanding this brief summary, it will be easier for you to read through these uh, this, uh, 20 page uh, articles. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, okay, next topic. Okay, we need to talk about some of the problems faced by socially engaged Buddhism also. Who would like to talk about the problem faced by socially engaged Buddhism? Still in the same, the same uh, subject. Oh, uh, yeah, it's number 25, correct? Yes. Yeah. Discuss what are the problems faced by socially engaged Buddhism um yeah i mean there's a lot <laughs> I, I mean the one that always pops up to me when i think of buddhism being i mean engaged with people in any matter uh, is the gender issue which i know that we've talked about in, in class with even uh some of the perspectives of the mahayanas with i can't remember that woman's name who married uh two women and like how the community felt about that so we see a sort of this buddhist perspective of social living and everyday life and the arguments that can happen between those and like what did the people think the buddha meant you know by sexual misconduct i know that was something that you dato had mentioned that was a mahayana argument that some buddhists and that you've encountered thought that it was like quote unquote unnatural so that's definitely you know one issue depending on the buddhist being involved with people in a social manner um and then also too within the community of course there's um you know this sort of women almost being second class citizens that's always been there like especially in theravada buddhism and i know i've told you guys before my time uh in thailand when amanda and i stayed at a thai forest monastery and just how she was treated much much differently i mean outside of women even being able to become bikinis but just also women in general like eating last coming in last had they had to go to bed at an earlier time they weren't allowed to talk to the men so a laundry list of gender issues so uh that's definitely a large one and then kind of playing off of that too thinking of just the ritual and dogma in general and how the society kind of like interprets that um 
you know, because it can be off-putting to people. I've known people even to go to different monasteries and just be confused by the process, it se seeming sort of very ritualistic, dogmatic, when they just don't understand certain things that are happening, like someone walking in a room and like a monastic and someone standing up to bow or, um, I mean, even something as simple as like bowing to a statue, which we know what's the reasons that we do that for ourselves and a bowing to our inner Buddha nature. And that's more of a issue with just educating people who don't understand Buddhism. But still, I mean, if we're talking about being socially engaged with Buddhism, we're inevitably going to encounter non-Buddhists and people will be, you know, confused by that. So I guess just the education that's important there with the globalization. Yeah, inter-religious relationships. There's a quote from the Dalai Lama I really like where he says, you know, if you're a Christian, be, you know, be a better Christian. And if you're interested in Buddhism, apply some of those practices if you wish, but you don't need to quote unquote convert. So I think that's like an important thing for people to know that there's no like conversion. You don't have to, you know, quote unquote, become a Buddhist to either reap some of the benefits from practicing the teaching or just be involved in general. And yeah, in class, we talked about uh, the capital punishment. Now that can be taken in different ways. Um, I know we were saying, uh, I'm trying to remember that story. It was, uh, I can't remember, I'll butcher it. Some, something about there was like a monk on a, on a ship and there was a pirate. It kind of makes me think of that. Like, it's not, uh, I mean, the, the take for tat, the exact same thing. But it was that story about the monk who, basically the pirate was like killing people and he said hey if you uh yeah either you kill me or, or the thought was he could kill him and prevent people from being killed or he could kill himself or he could kill some you know somebody else but it would be breaking the precept so it's not the exact same idea but i would think that people's arguments for capital punishment might, might be something along those lines like somebody might argue well hey if this person is killed it's going to save a lot more lives I would just imagine that would be one of the arguments versus the one, of course, of just no killing. It's pretty clear that those are one of the five precepts. So, but uh, still a problem that's faced by socially engaged Buddhism. Um, yeah, education is really important. Uh, I know, I can't remember the name of the town I was in or village I was at when I was in China, but we'd went to this Chan temple one time and he gave me a book so I, I can't read the Hansa on it but it was kind of like a a history of that that temple in that area and they had recently created a large education program where they were helping the local villagers like become more literate and learn about Buddhism as well as just a general education I think that's something that's important and something that you know, it definitely looks good for Buddhism in the sense that it's something that's not strictly religious, but it's also helping others to have an education. And I mean, how can people, you know, slowly in life try to develop their discernment and wisdom if they don't have some of the most basics of logic and reasoning and understandings of science? So, I mean, yeah, education is really important. Uh, yeah. Yeah, thanks, uh, Kelly, for your presentation. Yeah, in fact, uh, when we talk about humanistic Buddhism or, or, or rather uh, socially engaged Buddhism, we can't help but uh, uh, confront ourselves with this, uh, the problems of a humanist, of a socially engaged Buddhism. And uh, thank you for the many examples that you have given. Uh, I have summed up very simply. Uh, number one, there are so many issues. And so which issues we are going to take? And sometimes we pick up on certain issues and uh, within our own Buddhist com community, some will say, why are you taking up this issue? There are other more important issues. So that alone, uh, there is enough debate on that. But I think the main problem is, even on the same issue that we are taking up, it's not easy to reach consensus even among the Buddhists. We take the example of politics in uh, Sri Lanka. Some monks uh, fight for mem become, to become members of parliament. 
but other monks uh, condemn uh, them for doing that. So uh, if there's no there, there is no consensus as to whether monks should be allowed to to become members of parliament, and uh, arising from that, we have people begin to 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 doubt. Uh, what Buddhism is all about because one side will say I am uh, I am uh, looking for this uh, political power to be a member of parliament well out of compassion for other people and uh, I'm doing this without greed, really hatred and delusion on the other side the other party also say I'm doing this without greed, really hatred and delusion I am also out of compassion so uh, uh, such conflicts uh, eventually becomes a challenge to the fundamentals of Buddhism. Uh, what do we really mean by Greek hatred and delusion? Everybody would claim that uh, they are free from Greek hatred and delusion. They are doing things out of compassion, but they are not agreeable with each other. Uh, so this is the kind of uh, problem that uh, we have to face. So we just have to and carry on uh, to deal with some of these problems. I always say uh, that's why we call this, this world is a world of dukkha or mm -hmm. a world of uh, unsatisfactoriness. Uh, we can't find sim uh, simple and direct solutions to all our problems. Okay, uh, we have one more last question about the Buddha as a reformer. All socially engaged Buddhists uh, try to keep the Buddha as an example of uh, social engagement. So they even go to the extent of uh, claiming that the Buddha was a social reformer. In a way, yes, the Buddha was a social reformer, but the Buddha was a religious teacher in the first place. Uh, perhaps a uh, uh, social reformer is a byproduct, just by the way that he became a social reformer. But anyway, this becomes a very strong argument for those who are promoting socially engaged Buddhism that the Buddha was a social reformer. So therefore, there is this one question here to discuss uh, the Buddha as a social reformer. Who would like to take this up? I the role of the Buddha as a social reformer. I will do this. Okay. The Buddha Another was one? the the Buddha was the foremost social reformer in human history. So the first one he did was uh, reforming the religious thought, denying God determinism, random and karma determinism, go for condition origination, cause and effect, from external salvation to self salvation, equality, everyone can attain Buddhahood from wait for next life to immediately experiencing sandhitiko. From self to no self, anatta. Buddha was the first one to teach no self and it was the greatest teaching of all time. And then the second, reforming religious practices. Buddha objected animal sacrifices. He suggested dana to replace animal sacrifices from prayers to re and rituals to self-cultivation. Self-cultivation replaces Brahmins. No need Brahmins to help you. Self-realization replaces speculation. Social reform, dismantling caste system by the Buddha. Everyone can attain Buddhahood leads to abolishment of caste. Social reform, uplift status of women. Everyone can attend Buddhahood leads to establishments of the bhikkhunis order, uplifts the status of women. Buddha consoles King Pasadnadi when his queen Malika delivered a baby girl. At the time, um, most people usually, um, the king, of course, he wants the boy to uh, you know, to uh, inherit his position. So when the baby girl was born, he was not very happy. So the Buddha consoled him. He said, a girl well brought up may be better than a boy. A woman was superior to a man if she was clever, virtuous, 
well-behaved and faithful. Then she could become the wife of a great king and give birth to an almighty ruler. So education reform. The Buddha was an educator par excellence. Education for all, all those who have ears may hear. His teach according to the mentality, teach according to the event, influenced early education in Asia. Established the Sangha as a body of learning. Monasteries were centers of education. Dhamma propagation is an educational process. So the main characteristic of the Buddha's reformation is peaceful reformation with wisdom and skill interreligious dialogue. So this is the answer. Tato, you're muted. At all, we cannot hear. Okay, all right, all right. Sometimes you know, you forget that you are muted. <laughs> so, okay, so uh, thank you, Reverend, for your presentation on the Buddha as a reformer. Uh, I think. The Buddha's uh, reforming religious thought was a very strong uh, reformation in India at that time. Especially when the Brahmins uh, believed in the creator God, the Brahma. And when the Buddha actually uh, talked about karma and talked about our, our, we create ourselves, we are responsible for our own self. So it was a, really a great uh, challenge to the Brahmanism at that time. So this was one of the greatest uh, reformation uh, uh, talked about by the Buddha. And uh, luck luckily or fortunately, in India at that time, the atmosphere was such that uh, there were many schools of religious thought and all were quite, all, all were allowed and not suppressed. So there were many uh, schools of thought at that time and uh, all could, uh, uh, could uh, interact with each other and talk to each other. That's why the Buddha also had the uh, interreligious dialogue with the religious leaders of uh, other other belief systems. So that's why today, even in India, you can see in India today, India is a multi-religious society, a multi-religious society, multi-cultural society, whereby you see that uh, all religions actually coexist. And they had no problem for a long time coexisting together. So thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, perhaps we take a break, then we we'll come back. We will do something else.
Okay, are we all back? Yes. Okay, we can continue, right? I have uh, left this one last chapter on Buddhism in Thailand. Thailand was formerly called Siam. Uh, or formerly called Siam, and uh, now they have a and then at one time they changed back to Thailand, and then at one time they changed back to Siam. Now it's back to Thailand. Thailand is a very is a Romanized name, a modern name. An actual name in the past has always been called Siam. Uh, we would like to talk something about Buddhism in Th Thailand because uh, Thailand and Myanmar are two very strong hold of uh, Buddhism together with uh, Sri Lanka, the three, uh, three nations with the most number of uh, Buddhists, Theravada Buddhists. Now if we look at the situation in Thailand, it, unlike other ASEAN countries, Thailand was not colonized. Whereas uh, Indochina, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam were colonized by the French, India, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Malaysia were colonized by the British, Indonesian by the Dutch, and so on. Thailand was the only country that was spared from being colonized. But in reality, actually, uh, it was at a price that they paid. Part of the areas that was formerly under Thailand uh, were taken out from Thailand and put under, for example, put under uh, the colonial powers. For example, Southern Thailand, the states of uh, uh, Trunganu, Gada, Perlis, and uh, Plantan. The four states which are now in Malaysia, they were actually protectorate of Thailand. So, after negotiating with the British, the British uh, became the protectorate of this or, or the colonial power of this country, these four states. And after the independence, these four states uh, remained as part of Malaysia and no longer part of Thailand. And then same thing for Laos and Cambodia and uh, Burma. They, they used to have some fightings at, at the borders, and some of these areas, Thailand claimed to be part of their protectorate or their land, but they were taken away by the French. But in a way, it saved the country from being fully colonized. So, because the country was not fully colonized, uh, the history of Buddhism in this country is a little bit different from the other few countries in Asia, South Asia. Buddhism has always received royal patronage in Thailand and uh, until today, it is still relatively tightly controlled by the government. So there is an institution called Sangha Raja or the head of the Sangha, but the Sangha Raja is, uh, is appointed by the king. During the Cold War period, Pai Wutren was in turbulence with multiple challenges on all fronts. He was in fact at the forefront of the hot war, especially the Vietnam War. We say Vietnam War, but actually sometimes it is also called, it is also called Indochina War, Second Indochina War. Because the communists, the Viet Cong, they were traveling down to create a problem in the south by traveling through Laos and they also camped in uh, Cambodia. So actually the three countries were all involved and USA's uh, planes, helicopters sometimes took off from Thailand border. So Thailand was in a way partly involved in providing the the, the ground support for the Vietnamese war. So Buddhism at, at that time was also not spared from such turbulence and uh, they were monks with different political ideologies and they were at odds with each other. 
some were more pro-communist, some were anti-communist. So this was some of the problems. But if you look at the, the problem of Buddhism in Thailand today, this uh, Donald Schwerer, he, he wrote on the situation in Thailand today, he said, modernization or the changing traditions, customs, values as the country modernized or westernized. Traditional Thai Buddhism is believed these institutions have lost its centrality in the lives of many, especially among the educated elite. When Western education, many professionals are educated in the West. All this eroded the meaning of traditional symbols, values, and institutions. Uh, those of us who are living just next to Thailand, we all know that uh, Thailand is a very Buddhist country in many ways. But actually, many of us also do not realize that, uh, especially in the past two or three decades, uh, the, the traditional Thai Buddhism uh, have been eroded to quite, quite a lot of extent, uh, quite extensively. Especially, let's say we take an example, in the past, uh, practically every male in Thailand would become a novice monk once in a lifetime. But this is no longer the case in the last uh, two or three decades, especially in the cities uh, where youngsters uh, could not find time to become a more smart now. Even for the day, they could not find time. But they, they need to find time for their computer games or, or, or piano classes and things like that. So many of them uh, do not become monks now. Whereas in the past, even the king, the, the, the previous king the, who passed away, he, he was a monk for quite some time. And therefore, the second problem faced is that the respect for monks has actually waned because uh, many monks uh, came from poor families and not so well educated, uh, whereas uh, uh, those uh, day Buddhists in the cities uh, educated in the Western way, and some of them even travel to the West. So, travel to the West, they are educated, so they became uh, better educated than the monks. And therefore, the monks' uh, roles have winter to become like ceremonial and quasi magical roles. So, those of you who have traveled to Thailand, you will notice that uh, many monks, not many, but I'm sorry, not. Uh, not the minority, I would say quite a lot, uh, I would say maybe majority, uh, perform ceremony. Uh, sometimes people even bring cars to the temple to be blessed, so that the car won't get into accident. And uh, they will produce charms for people to bring home, to get protection and things like that. So when we talk about uh, uh, socially engaged Buddhism in Thailand today, we can't miss this personality by the name of Buddha Dasa, uh, 1906 1993. That means he passed away not too long ago. Buddha Dasa, why he was so unique? Now, he was born into a middle class family in southern Thailand, uh, southern Thailand near the Russian border, at the isthmus of Krave, the thinnest part of Thailand. Uh, his uh, father actually was uh, Chinese from uh, southern, Thai, southern China who migrated to, to, to southern Thailand and opened a sundry shop or rice shop, things like that. So he was brought up there and uh, his brother, and the family was, uh, I would say, uh, middle class or or upper middle class, whereby his brother was able to enter into a, a, a university in, uh, in Bangkok. But he himself was very keen about religions and uh, he, 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 and he became a monk. And uh, one of his uh, earliest, he was among one of the earliest to deal with this uh, the situation of Buddhism in Thailand, especially during the Vietnam War period. And we say that uh, he is a pioneer in the application of the Dharma to the modern world. 
he always went back to the original source of Buddhism, restoring the original pristine teaching of the Buddha, distinguish it from the cultural practices and superstitions that had inevitably crept in into Thai Buddhism. Like in many other places, Thai Buddhism have a lot of uh, superstitious elements that have crept in over the years, especially the use of charm, you know, um, and prayer for merits, and giving dana to get merits and things like that, that uh, Buddha Dasa tried to wish to go back to the original teachings of Buddha. He interpreted the Pali Tipitaka or the Tipitaka Buddhism in the light of his primary principles. So when he thought about the Tipitaka, he always thought about the Noble Truth, the Four Noble Truth, Anatta or Sunyanta or Water, and then the Patisha Samupada or the Kajan Origination. So that all of the core teachings fit together and better understood by uh, to each other. So in doing so, he moved away from some of the cherries, uh, a bit uh, secondary dogmas of Orthodox Thayvara, Thayvara Buddhist belief. For example, in Thailand, uh, you know, uh, Thailand, uh, despite the fact that it's, been, it's a Buddhist country, is also well known for having the most number of prostitutes in the world. So, uh, the problem is the, the Buddhism in Thailand try to say that uh, they become prostitutes because of their bad past karma. Bad past karma. So, this was actually wrong, wrong teaching, uh, wrong interpretation of the Dhamma. So, he tried to correct it. This is not the case. So, what he was doing has a lot of consequences, including an emphasis on the here and now, the rediscovery of the spiritual dimension of everyday life, a reaching of the lay monastic fracture, the bringing, bridging the, the, the gap between the lay and the lay monastic people, and the greater compatibility with science. Because his, of his better education, he was able to, to talk about Buddhism from the perspective of science, and then the greater intellectual rico, and therefore Buddha Dasa has got many university students as, as uh, his disciples. And the uh, reintegration of political and social issues within the Dhammic worldview. Because of the political turmoil, especially during the Vietnam War period, uh, so he was able to, to talk about political issues from the Dhammic worldview. My comment is, or my observation is, uh, you, you, you will notice that uh, it's very much the same emphasis as in the case of Tai Chi and Ying Sun. So this was the case also for uh, the Buddha Dasa. And also the case of, say, similar to Tai Chi and Ying Sun, they both, three of them all try to go back to the Buddha's teaching to deal with modern issues. So, uh, Buddha Dasa was famous for his Dhammika Sangha, Sangha Niyama. Dhammika Sangha Niyama, or translated into English, uh, Dhammic Socialism. He was uh, famous for uh, propounding this idea of uh, Dhammic Socialism, or Dhammika Sangha Niyama. In the 1960s, during the Vietnam War period, uh, Actually, Vietnam War, one of the reasons was that uh, the West or the capitalist world were, were, was afraid that uh, communism would spread southward from China, Vietnam, and then Thailand, Malaya, and you know, coming downwards. So it was a fight between the capitalists and the communists at that time. So there were a lot of uh, political debates in the 1960s, and uh, there were, in fact, people already talking about Buddhist socialism. So Ulu, Ulu Prime Minister of, uh, uh, of uh, Myanmar, Banarayaka, Prime Minister of Sri Lanka, Sihanok, the king of uh, Cambodia, they all advocated Buddhist socialism. But how deep they go into it, I do not know. I would say it's just uh, superficially, but on their lips, they're talking about, since they are Buddhists, they talk about 
Buddhist socialism. And it, it was an attempt to amalgamate Buddhist teachings with the economy and political philosophy of the West at that time to meet the new social, religious, political demand of their time. But uh, none of them came up with a theory like what the Buddha Dasa did. From Buddha Dasa, what Buddha Dasa said is very simple. Socialism is, is, a, is a natural, it's something natural because if you look at all the plants and animals, they live a social life. They live in a community. Therefore, socialism means living for the benefit of society, not for the individuals. Uh, so to him, it is not individualism or liberal democracy. If you talk about individualism or liberal democracy, this is rooted in personal identity. But if you look at the plants, uh, the animals in the forest, they, they live in an ecosystem uh, that uh, is not only for personal benefit, but in the ecos ecosystem that is mutually dependent. And he talked about the socialism of karma. Karma is about class struggle rooted in anger. So he, he, is, he, is, a, he is against this. It's not that dummy. And then capitalism and communism. To him, is the same. Both are the same. Both are adama or against the karma because both are rooted in the selfishness. In fact, he was against the party politics of the West. So he tried to explain his Dhammika Sangha Yama but in terms of Dharma as nature and Dhammi as based on Dharma or nature. At this juncture, maybe I can share with you my, my, my way of presenting the word Dharma so that you can get a better understanding of the word Dharma. You see, if you drop something, if you drop something, that something will actually drop down, you won't go sideways. We call that the law of gravity. Since Newton discovered it, we say it is Newton's law of gravity. But whether Newton discovered it or not, that law exists. Okay? And that is that law actually is Dharma. If water is too hot, say 100 degrees centigrade, we can't drink it. Otherwise, we will be scattered. That is also Dharma. So Dharma is natural law. But the Buddha did not talk about the two examples I gave you just now, about the law of gravity, about the law of heat. Why he did not talk about these two? Because he got no time. He wanted, he, he had to spend his time to talk about the most critical thing and the most important thing related to our human salvation. And I say he had no time because the uh, once when he passed by a forest, he took some leaves from the forest and asked his monk, which is small. Then of course the monk, the monk said, uh, those in the forest is small and those in your hand is less. So the Buddha says, likewise, the Dhamma that I've taught you are just like the leaves in my hand. And the Dhamma that I have not taught you are like the leaves in the forest. So it's a matter of priority. So the Buddha talked about the Dhamma that is related to our immediate problem, our immediate uh, human unsatisfactoriness and our release from this uh, human unsatisfactoriness through the number eight part. So this is his explanation of uh, Dharma. And in Dharma, it has to be interconnected, interdependence, which I have already mentioned to you just now. And it's not new. Okay? So he actually concluded that in Buddhism, uh, I mean, the uh, Dharmic socialism, to be a Buddhist, you have to be a socialist. Okay. Many intellectuals were interested in socialism, but only from political and economic point of view. But for Achan Buddha Dasa, that was too shallow. He felt it could never really succeed. Therefore, he began to articulate a view of socialism that was in harmony with, in fact, grow organically out from Buddhist principles and insight with the necessary moral underpinning and the guidance of Buddhist wisdom. He felt a genuine socialism could emerge that would bring peace. So his uh, Dharmic socialism is not only political and economical, he actually 
said it has to be moral also. It's a moral issue. You'll be wondering why are you talking? Why is he talking about moral? Well, Achan actually said, Achan, Achan uh, Uradasa actually said, well, we human beings, uh, when we are born, we are, we, we are, we, we say human beings are born as a show, as a political animals, as economic animals. We need to find food, we need to find a way to live. And then a political animal, we, deal, we need to deal with each other. But he further emphasized that we need to be moral. And by moral, it, it does not mean uh, moral of a precepts or morality that we are talking about. It, by moral, he means it must be something that is in accordance with the natural law. Okay? The meaning of moral. Okay? Some of these things I will skip. So Buddha Dasa actually urged a return to the Buddha Dharma by replacing merit making with the quest for Siddhartha. It's very common in Thailand. Thailand, Sri Lanka, and Denmark. You can see many people trying to offer dana to the monks with the intention of making merit. So I think he also got fed up with the merit making practices. He actually asked people very quest for Vibhana rather than to talk about making merit. And instead of memorizing the Abhidharma, Dharma, like a Greek scholar, better with replace it with the understanding of the suttas. And uh, to replace all the rituals, all the prayers, the rituals, ceremonies with meditation. This was his uh, emphasis. And uh, undue emphasis on monks with concern for the un replace undue emphasis on monks with concern for the entire community. So he urged his supporters, don't pay so much emphasis on monks but to have more concern for the society. So that was uh, Sangha Niyama. Dhamma Amnika Sangha Niyama promoted by, uh, by Buddha Dasa. But uh, you will notice that uh, there is nothing so dramatic like uh, what you see in uh, Vietnam or nothing so dramatic like what you saw, you saw in, uh, in uh, in India or Myanmar or Sri Lanka. That was because Thailand uh, was not fully colonized. Okay? Now, the most recent development I have to share with you is about this gentleman, Sulak Sivaraksa. He is now about uh, 84 or 86 years old, 1932. So, 80, 88 years old now. Yeah? He is the he is, he is also a second generation Chinese, but if you say he is a Chinese descendant, he will scold you. He, is, he, will, he will tell you that he is a Chinese. Okay. Uh, also from a second up from upper middle class in Bangkok and uh, father dealing with rice and things like that. So he received very good education. He went to uh, this uh, Christian missionary school, college, and then he went to study law in the UK. Now, this man, uh, when we talk about socially engaged Buddhism, uh, you can't miss him because today he is the president, he was the founder of this, this uh, international network of engaged Buddhists. And uh, he tried to promote. Uh, English Buddhism. So let's look at him. This is his picture as appeared in his Facebook. Uh, That's 84th No, he, he he insisted that uh, you 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 will never find him on a on a Western suit or necktie or a coat. You will never find him in that way. He would always wear, according to him, the traditional Thai dress. So he will he will always be. Uh, and in fact, he will tell you that uh, even in ancient times, the Thai kings were also bad on the upper body. Because our weather here is so hot, there, there was no necessity to wear uh, an, uh, an, uh, an upper garment. So, this Sivaraksa, 
was greatly influenced by Acham Buddha Dasa. He used to travel to Southern Island to meet Acham Buddha Dasa. So like Acham Buddha Dasa, he is the third generation Chinese. His grandfather came from uh, China. Then he went to missionary secondary school and then studied law in UK. So he is known in the West now and especially in the socially engaged Buddhism circle as one of the founders of the international network of engaged Buddhists. He is the man behind the reformation of monastic education. In the 1960s, uh, the Thai government and the, monast monast and the monastic orders or the Sangha felt that there was a need to modernize education for the monks in Thailand uh, to meet up with the uh, modern times. But actually, the hidden, uh, now is no longer hidden, now is, a, is, a, is an open secret that uh, the, the Thai government and the USA government felt that there was a need to educate the monk as a front to counter communism. So the monks need to be educated so that they wouldn't be, uh, become supporters of communism. So with the help of CIA, actually CIA provided the fund. CIA provided fund uh, for the Thai education department and the Sangha to work out a, a, a new education format for the monks. So a very well-known Bhikkhu by the name of Bhikkhu Payoto was the leader who came up with this uh, modern education for the monks. But the man behind us was uh, Sikipala Suvaraksa, who did a lot of ground job. Uh, so this was his uh, main contribution in bringing about some changes to the monks' education in Thailand. Then, in 1962 to 76 or so, he founded this uh, social science a, a journal, Social Science Review, to guide potential intellectuals, actually meant to influence young people to follow his ways. So he actually had a lot of young people who always uh, uh, came over to his house at, uh, you know, at the river side in Bangkok, and sometimes uh, spend day and night at his house talking about politics, what actors to do and things like that. That's why I mentioned to you, Payuto. You also need to learn his name at least. The foremost Buddhist scholar in Thailand, equivalent to Ling Shun of Taiwan. He's also of Chinese descent. And then we have this uh, October incident. We call it October's incident. Because in 1943 October, there was a student uprising. Uh, many people were killed. And the Chief, the, the, the Prime Minister at that time, Panom Kitikachon, uh, fled the country. And uh, when the Panom Kitikachon, the, who was a military, uh, military ruler, fled the country, uh, so it opened the gate for democracy. And uh, therefore, every side, including the, the communist side or the Marxist side, tried to gain power. So the Communist Party of Thailand also began to infiltrate the students and many students went for Marxism or Maoism and even disowned their past culture and traditions, including Buddhism. So some of the Buddha students actually came and told Buddha now I'm going to be a communist. They thought that uh, with Hanam flag, then the communism would be, the, would be ruling Thailand. Thailand. But actually, uh, communism did not succeed. But Sula was able to warn them that uh, not only the not only the leaders had fled, but the system remained the same. So he refused to follow the young students' uh, advice to go to get go along with communism. So uh, they say he was an old-fashioned old man. But you must understand. Three years later, there was another coup. October 1976 or so, and this time uh, Sulak actually went into exile. 
In fact, one thing is that uh, Sulak Sivak staff try to adhere to non-violence all, all the way. After the October 73, actually many students urged him to join them in the Communist Party of Thailand, but he refused. And for that, many Communist uh, students uh, hated him. But after the, 19, the coup again, 1976, actually from 1976 until today, I lost count of how many coups, military coups have happened in Thailand. You know? Every now and then, the present uh, ruler was also from military coups. But Sula refused to join the student. And by 1980, actually many ex-Communist Party of Thailand students returned to the society and embraced Buddhism again. So Sula was famous for formation of many NGOs, but the most successful one, and perhaps the only successful one, is the 1989 establishment of the International Network of Engaged Buddhists, of which now I'm in the advisory committee. That's why I, I had a photograph with him just now. But it would be interesting to know that actually Sivaraksa has a life of antimony, you know, life of contradiction. You'd be surprised that despite being educated in the West, being a lawyer, he actually uphold monarchy. But at the same time, he always uh, speak against uh, the monarchs in a certain way. So he was charged under this uh, last majesty. In fact, the most recent one, uh, fortunately, he was, uh, he was eventually, uh, the, the prosecution eventually discharged. You'll be surprised, some, some, some of the laws in uh, Thailand, uh, some of them, some of those can be, can be very surprising to you. For example, the most recent case, he went to a university and he was talking about history of Thailand and he was talking about an, a dead king, a king that had died many years back and uh, said that uh, he did not actually uh, fought the war, he actually lost the war, he didn't win the war. And from that he was charged. He was charged for less, less majesty. But anyway, that, that prosecution was eventually uh, withdrawn. He was pro america and anti america pro america at one time he was actually getting support, monetary support from CIA to conduct, to, to, to formulate courses for months. But later stage, he was anti america He was very much left inclined in many ways in terms of uh, political ideology, but he was anti-communism. He know China very well, but he also dissent China. He was anti Taksin. Taksin was the best prime minister of prime minister, elected prime minister of Thailand from 2001 to 2005, and again re elected in 2006, but was overthrown. So Taksin was overthrown by military. So he was anti Taksin, and yet he agreed to military coup. So very, I would say a very marvelous uh, character. Then uh, now I'd like to share with you some of the things in Southern Thailand. Thailand Southern Thailand, this is the part that joined to Malaya. I told you just now this part, this, this part, and this part was formerly Thailand, but was ceded to the British. And this part, Yala. Yala, Patani, Naratiwi, these three provinces in Thailand had a concentration of Muslim population. There are Thai people, Burmese, Siamese people here, but they, 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 they are less, less in number. The same thing in uh, our Malaysian border here. We have Thai, some Thai population here, Siamese population, but minority. Here, same thing. These people here, had been trying to fight for uh, independence. So they formed the Pati, Patani Liberation Army and so on, wanting to join uh, Malaysia or things like that. So let's look at the problem in the south. 204 unrest in southern Thailand, 
over 6,500 people died and almost 12,000 were injured between 2004 and 2015 in a formerly ethnic separatist insurgency. And during that period of time, I came across in the newspaper frequently many monks were killed when they were on arms around uh, these uh, insurgents uh, bomb and kill them. These insurgents were the Hakai jihadists. These Hakai jihadists, they were not only against the Thai-speaking Buddhists, and, but also against those moderate who supported the Thai government. So, in uh, 2006, actually, the International Network of Engaged Buddhists, and just, just is an organization called Just, Just International, we organized a region for peace, Buddhist Muslim dialogue in Dusit, Bangkok. 2006, 35 participants from eight countries participated. And uh, I was one of the participants uh, from Malaysia. So, this was where we tried to, to, to create understanding uh, among uh, people of different religions. So, this kind of uh, work by INET and JAS is useful in a way that uh, when we are in an international forum, we try to see uh, the problem faced by people in different perspectives. So i give you an example. Uh, Thai Muslims in Southern Thailand uh, complained that uh, in the schools, there were Buddha images in the schools. So they complained. They, they felt that this was like an insult since the majority were Muslim in the schools. So I told them, do you know that in Malaysia, we have a mini mosque or surah in every school, primary, secondary, until the universities. And universities sometimes have mosques in the universities. And, and some of the schools, uh, there may be only 15, uh, 15 Muslim Malays, but there may be another thousand uh, non Malays. But we still have a mosque or a surah inside the, the compound. So, in that way, we, we, create, we begin to see each other's problems. So some, sometimes uh, this kind of uh, global interaction would help us to see uh, each other's problems. Okay? So now we go back to the general, to the reason, reason, the most recent one. Now also we have this uh, demonstration against the king of Thailand. Yeah, you see some monks in, uh, among the protesters, but generally the vast majority stay away. So compared with Sri Lanka and Thailand, the socially engaged Buddhism in Thailand is generally more subtle and less radical. Okay, so this is just a brief uh, account of uh, the situation in uh, in uh, Thailand. Okay, uh, so uh, maybe we can have a breakdown. Then uh, we come back in 15 minutes' time. I will share some another topic with you. And uh, we will wind up. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Go back. Sure. Okay, we are nearing the end of our this uh, subject on humanistic Buddhism. There's only one last topic that I would like to share with you. But uh, I think in order to manage the time better, because I can make my lecture in half an hour or one hour. So, but I would like to get some feedback from you now uh, before I proceed to, to discuss about the uh, uh, one the socially engaged issue that is the the abolishment of the punishment. I would like to get some feedback from you. Uh, what have you learned from this uh, course? Or from each one of you, I would like to hear from you. But what we have learned 
any new things that you have learned and then uh, whether you have any suggestions to improve the, the cost. So can I have some feedback from you, please? Yeah, I'll start. Um, so this whole course in general, I, we're kind of like in the beta testing of the whole thing. Like this is the first time that this has been done. Um, your ability to stay on schedule and the outlines and the PowerPoint presentations and your, your giving those to us for our own use has been extremely amazing and beneficial. Like you, uh, it, the flow of your classroom is uh, very, uh, I, I appreciate it a lot. Uh, now, as far as things that I've learned, like, you know, here in the US, even though we were involved with the Vietnam War, uh, you know, it's mostly just told to us that it was about communism. And I had no idea the amount of uh, Buddhism influence that the Vietnam War had. Uh, that That's one thing. There's tons that I've, I've learned and I appreciate, but that thing, that's one thing that sticks out in my mind that uh, the uh, the emulation, uh, self-immolation and you know, the the killings and everything else that took place uh, is kind of not talked about in U.S. schools as much. It's just all about the communism and, you know, our, our involvement you know, on that end of things. So uh, uh, that's that's all I got to say. Thank you very much. I would like to hear especially what, what have you learned, you see, because uh, we have spent so much time together in uh, if if there is nothing much that you have learned, then uh, I would have failed. <laughs> so, so, okay, any feedback from the rest? We are all together, 13 of you in the class. Yeah, um, I'll start and say a few things. Yes, something that uh, I've always, I've always known about the difference, like the diff some of the differences between Mahayana and Theravada Buddhism, I suppose, but uh, one of the things that I thought was really interesting was kind of seeing those arguments come to life more between, you know, the, the Bodhisattva path and Mahayana Buddhism, and then the sort of derogatory perspective some Mahayanas have taken by calling Theravana, you know, the Hinayana, the small vehicle. I mean, that was just one small thing that popped out to me that it kind of just having the historical context and background with like understanding how some of those suttas became more of a focal point in Mahayana Buddhism. And then some of those people's, you know, questions about like, well, how did the Buddha become the Buddha lifetime to lifetime? What type of life was he living in? Why do we follow this Bodhisattva path? Like, I just never, it, it's given me a, a better appreciation for both Mahayana and Theravada Buddhism in different ways. And then talk also then looking at like different social contexts outside of that. So, I mean, I personally am very much a proponent of, you know, self-development and I love the Shravaka path and like working on yourself. Cause I believe, you know, how can you save the world until you save yourself? And I'm very much a proponent of like what the Buddha taught, love the Pali Canon, but then to see like, you know, there are some of these gender inclusiveness issues in Theravada Buddhism that Mahayana has, you know, tried to, fight against because they're in general being much more socially active in terms of there are monks who you know are trying to be more involved socially so much so that as we've talked about for better or for worse even some of them are becoming politicians and it's you know a breath of fresh air to see that there are people who with this idea of humanistic buddhism want to i don't want to say update because i don't like the idea of like you know picking and choosing what teaching works for one person and not another and I don't like the idea of like slicing certain things out for, you know, what serves a better social agenda. But I, I like that there's this attempt in the, on the Mahayana side with humanistic Buddhism to try to make things more like modern, accessible, getting involved socially, having educational outreach. Um, it's interesting because beforehand, like I'd actually heard pretty pessimistic things about like Fu Guangshan, for example, in Taiwan. And I've heard some people say that they've try to give their own versions of the three refuges and i've i've had a couple of friends who went to taiwan and kind of got wrapped up in their whole business spiel and didn't have a great experience but then this class has actually given me 
more of a positive outlook, kind of understanding that, that maybe, you know, they just encountered a couple people who uh, had maybe some, some kind of their own agenda in Fogong Shan, but it, it's, it's, you know, been really nice to actually learn what humanistic Buddhism is. Cause like, I think we even said at the start of class, like I always just assume, <coughs> assumed that it is that Buddhism is humanistic. It is human centered. It is this, uh, you know, re revolving inward connection, not this vertical connection, or anything else. So, uh, but yeah, it's, it's been good to know, to learn that. Um, I've always known about Yin Shun's influence as well, but it was interesting because I didn't know how much scholarly work he had done and how important he was to Chinese and Taiwanese uh, Buddhist development. Um, but yeah, I, I've, I've learned, I mean, from all the classes we've had, I feel like this one's been very, it's like Corey alluded to, it, it has been very, uh, it's, it's been really well organized and I really like the subject content that we covered and uh, yeah, it was really enjoyable. Thank I, you. I have to agree. I have to agree with both Corey and Kyle. It's been quite interesting and eye opening because like them, I thought naturally Buddhism was humanistic. It's kind of ingrained, but to know that there's actually a system that defines humanistic Buddhism. I think that's very valuable. As for uh, saying what, what I learned, there's a lot of information that, we, that we've compiled um, in this course in the last six weeks. And so to pull one thing out, it, it would be difficult, but, um, and, and and right now I'm feeling a little bit overwhelmed to tell to tell you the truth because we've been going over all these questions and it's settled in that there's a lot of, there's a lot of information to know in this class but I think that the way you taught it brought it down to our level you didn't you didn't um, you didn't try to use a teaching style which made us feel stupid or at least for me it didn't it, it seems like you taught to our level of understanding and and i really appreciate that because this could have been a lot more difficult had you not brought it down to like i call myself a kindergarten buddhist i think that it, it allowed me to to absorb a lot more information and um and I found the class fascinating because of the the nuances that you included in the historical background. Thank you. I, thank you very much. I always believe that uh, to understand the flow properly, we must begin with the historical background. That's why I give you some of the historical background. Some of the topics like, uh, for example, the pluralist belief of the Chinese, well, it's not part of the syllabus, but uh, still I have to talk about it so that you, once you go through the course, you will have a better understanding of the Chinese belief system. I have only one difficulty because I do not know whether you have studied some aspects of Mahayana Buddhism. And if you have not studied some aspect of Mahayana Buddhism, then uh, when we talk about humanistic Buddhism, which is practiced in China and Taiwan, there are, hum there are humanistic Buddhism of the Mahayana tradition. So if you don't have the background of understanding some of the, the, the teachings of Mahayana, then that will be a bit difficult. That's why I try to simplify so that uh, you can, can, can follow. And also, I also do not know University of Karania, the syllabus, whether they... Because of my understanding in the University of Karania in Sri Lanka, it should be more on the Theravada tradition. But I'm comfortable with Thera Theravada tradition anyway. Oh, thank you, Lee. Uh, Lee. Okay, any I, I feedback from somebody else? Well, um, I have learned a lot about uh, Buddhism in some other countries, like for instance, uh, China in the 19th century. Some of these things you've talked about are, uh, it's very difficult to find information on them in English. 
So you've made things available to us that we would not have found before or even been able to maybe read about. So you've brought us a lot of information and also mentioning um, some of these other scholars like David Loy, for instance, so that we can go on and, and uh, read some of their works. I, I had never heard of Holmes Walsh before, for instance, even though I've, I've looked for a lot of information on like China in the 19th century, his name had never come up. So um, you've uh, taught us a lot of things and also brought us some resources that we can use for further study. And I appreciate that. Thank you, Sherry. Yes. So other people? Yeah. I, would agree. I was actually thinking about saying the same thing as Sherry. I think I started to talk, but the microphone wasn't working. Um, a lot of these things I found out in doing the homework, if you Google them, there's sometimes not a lot of information like the five vehicles, uh, at least in English, there's not a lot of resources that uh, fundamentally explain the, the history of it. Um, like, how did this come about? You might be able to find what Taishu five vehicles were and, and all that, but you don't really see the background of it. Um, like even just the origins of the Jinling publishing house, stuff like that. Um, you can see some of the most basic information, but as far as where that came from historically, how that arose, that type of stuff. In English, there's not anything to find on that that I could see, at least not in a, a beginning search. So that's one of the things that I find the most useful about the PowerPoint slides is at least um, when I'm looking into a subject, um, if there are no resources, um, like you know, some of the things we've talked about more recently, uh, for example, like the, the um, monks in Vietnam and the struggles in the Vietnamese war about how that came about from a different perspective than the American perspective and the Western perspective. Uh, it begins to allow you to know what to look for as far as finding more resources and looking into it more. So I think that's been one of the most valuable things is, is uh, you know, Google is, is from the view of a Westerner, we see what they think a Westerner would want to see. So you don't always see another perspective. Um, so I'm grateful for that. And this on its own, the, the class resources are a good starting point to look into things further so that if you do want to learn more about it, you can pull those up and say, oh, Dato said that this is important and this is important as far as the historical context. And then you can kind of go from there and look into those specific issues and maybe Google will pre present you with those issues. So I find that to be very valuable uh, on its own. So I'm grateful for that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, actually, one of my uh, challenges was to, was to digest the scholarly work done by Westerners. Uh, a lot of the scholarly work done by Westerners, for example, uh, Christopher King uh, and, uh, and Queen, and then uh, David Loy, uh, they were great works, but uh, not so easy to digest because they, they are scholars, and scholars with a lot of references and things like that. Uh, I have to try and digest and simplify so that uh, we can all uh, grab it especially when if we are learning it for the first time. Of course, uh, for people who are already quite familiar with the Buddhist movement, uh, it's, it's easy to understand. You just have to read it for once or twice, you can understand. But for those who are just exposed for the first time, uh, then my task would be to make it simpler for you. Okay, So that's why some of them, I just put a few points, but I would expect you to be able to expand a little bit more. Okay, uh, anybody else? Some feedback or any suggestions? Anything that I have missed? This is Josh, an auditor, just real quick. I've heard of the semi secret society, the, the, the Theosophical Society, and I knew they were wide reaching, but I just had no idea uh, the, the depth and how pivotal that was in uh, influencing some of the um, massive change 
modern change in Buddhism. And uh, yeah, it's, that's something I'm very fascinated in. And a lot of it's, you know, some of it's public, some of it's secret. So thank you. Thank you very much. I, I hope to, if this, the class is helpful, at least you enrich yourself, that uh, you learn something more. Okay, anybody else? Yes, um, I like to say that um, the information presented here is very abundant. It's eye-opening to me. There are a lot of things that I didn't know before what happened in those countries that I got to know what happened. And it made me realize that what Buddha says, this world is very suffering. Look at so many things that happen. Indeed, it's suffering to so many people. And it is a great that we have those uh, great uh, uh, monks that um, will come uh, in time to help us uh, buckle down our car seat, you know, the buckle the, uh, in the seat so people can get through the turbulence. And, and what the Buddha's teaching keep, keep coming back to us, that's, that's the core that can help us to live through this life. Uh, more peacefully. So really appreciate uh, what you gave it to us in this class. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Lisa. And uh, anybody else? So this is Toshita. I appreciate the information on uh, all sorts of different social movements presented in this class, especially in Chinese context, the uh, Renjian. Fajio, French and Fajio in, uh, well, French, French in Taiwan, French in China. Um, while I do not necessarily personally agree with some of those contexts, I, I appreciate the opportunity to learn about them. Uh, that I think is the biggest thing I learned, I think. Yeah, we don't have to agree with some of them. <laughs> we need, we need, need to have a like in Buddhism, we say mindfully aware of what is happening. Right, I agree. Keep uh, keep an open mind. So I'm trying to keep an open mind. Uh, but but those are fascinating, uh, fa fascinating facts. Uh, I think uh, I concur with many of the other comments. Uh, had I not taken this class, I would have not bothered to even know about them. So I appreciate the opportunity. And I frankly think uh, Dato did an excellent job presenting material. Uh, thank you. A anybody else would like to say something about this, about this course? Give me some feedback or some suggestions so that we can do it better. Okay. So, if not, uh, uh, yes. I think, yes. I think one thing too that has been helpful, um, I just wanted to say as far as any feedback or maybe suggestions, I think that if uh, it's hard on Zoom to know uh, when we do discussion, it's hard to know how to speak up because half the time you will start talking and then someone else is talking and then they might say the same thing you were going to say and then you end up, you know, stopping. So I don't know. I like when we have uh, one thing that's been really good that we've done a couple of times is that we'll just say, OK, uh, so and so, what do you think? And then so and so, what do you think? So that everybody kind of has to take a turn because that way we're not all just stepping all over each other's toes. Uh, and that's just a Zoom thing, I think, that has interrupted any kind of normal uh, dialogue that we would have been able to have naturally, I think has been has been interrupted for that reason. So I do like that whenever we have specifically said it's, uh, it's your turn to say something, your turn to say something. So I just wanted to offer that. Yeah, actually Zoom is not the best way to conduct a class, <laughs> but uh... Under present circumstances, we, we have to resort to this method. Uh, University of Karania actually insisted that it must be on a real life class. Then the, the interaction, of course, will be much better. At least when we crack jokes, uh, people, we can hear people uh, laughing. But here, when we crack jokes, uh, we look at the computer and we do not know what's happening. <laughs> okay, thank you.
I'm trying to to get my computer to share screen. Now it's stuck. We see your screen. Uh, your screen. You can see me, right? Can we see uh, abolishment for capital punishment? For oh, okay, okay. Now I can see here. Okay, <laughs> share. Okay. Okay. Can you see? Yes, sir. Yes, okay. we could see. Yeah. It, one, I, I, I had mentioned to you earlier that uh, there are many social issues. For example, about the LGBT, about uh, gender inclusiveness or gender equality. Now we use a better term, we say inclusiveness. And then uh, one of the issues uh, that uh, become a hot topic in Malaysia is the abolishment of capital punishment. And therefore, I prepare a lecture on this topic. Now, abolishment of capital punishment. This is a, a, another illustration that uh, that uh, socially engaged Buddhists have to face the problem of arriving at a consensus. In different monks have different consensus. You look at this venerable Xin Yi. He did not. He does not support the abolishment of capital punishment. He believes that people are convicted by who are convicted by law are sentenced according to the seriousness of their motives and action. Basically, if a transgression is committed, one must serve some type of sentence or receive punishment. The only where the death penalty is inescapable. Why? This is cause and effect. There will be retribution to murder. So how could one escape the death penalty? However, if one committed the act of killing involuntarily or was forced to other, by others or was committed during the time of war, then of course the outcome of karma will be accordingly heavy or light. So Shindi was against the abolishment of punishment, abolishment of capital punishment or death penalty. Then you look at Venerable Shen Yen. He said, should capital punishment be abolished? As a Dharma master, of course, I hope it will be abolished. Well, he's not committed, you know, he's just saying, I hope you'll be a boy. He said that there are no unchanging bad people and all sentient beings can become Buddhas. He argued that abolishing capital punishment should take two parts. Le legally decrease the number of death sentences and promote religious education so as to prevent crime. Okay. Then there was our way. Uh, I say he's a left, leftist Buddhist. Okay. Vendra Chahui says, the Buddha has stated very clearly that no killing is the first rule of the faith five percent. It is absolutely impossible for Buddha to speak favorably of solving problems through killing. Killings will only lead to more killings. It is not necessary for the victims and their family members to take revenge personally, and no third parties are needed to join into the network of killing. Let their own karma take their own run. See, that was Vendra Chahui. Then you look at Suji. Suji, I translate it for you. You look at the story. After listening to the opinion of Mr. Sia, you know who is this Mr. Sia? This Mr. Sia is a state legislative assemblyman in Taiwan. And he was appealing to, uh, to appeal to the government to do away with the death sentence that was already passed on to one Mr. Liu Huan Rong. Liu Huan Rong. This man admitted that he killed several people. He has he had killed several people. He admitted also. And uh, while he was in the death cell, he, he made appeals uh, and he tried to tell the whole world that he has uh, transformed and, and he had he had become a good man. Therefore, this Mr. Sia appealed for Mr. Liu Huang Rong to be, uh, to be released from his uh, capital punishment. So Mr. Sia, in order to try to get Chen Yen's support, actually met this Chen Yen. 
and then after yesterday, well, after yesterday, she expressed that we should have patience when faced with social problems. She could feel the love of Mr. Xia. She also felt sad over what happened to Liu Huan Rong, but she reiterated that we should not lose hope of society because of this. If every structure of the society work together, a peace society could be realized soon. Do you all understand what she was trying to say? Do you all understand what she was trying to say? Now, if you cannot understand, I can understand. That is what, is, that is what she was trying to say. You know, sometimes uh, some Chinese talk in such a way that you cannot understand. Well, this chief relevant Dr. Sri Kamaranda, I will skip this one. Thik Nang Han also against. So what is the British stand? I give you the answer now. Venerable Shingi against abolishment. Okay? Venerable Chao Hui is for the abolishment. Venerable Sir Yen, yes, but. Okay? So this giant, uh, four system of logic of the Oriental people. Okay? Yes, no, both yes and no, neither yes nor no. Okay? Case 3 Tamanda say respect the law. Suji, Actually, no answer. It is a jumbo jumbo. That something that you cannot understand. You cannot gather anything out of that. And that is very typical of uh, uh, Suji's way of handling these kind of social issues. Always uh, no answer, actually. So, now we look at the Buddhist teachings. We all know first precepts, Ahimsa, first precepts, uh, and then Dhammapada, chapter 10, verse 129, 130. Everyone fear punishment, everyone fear death, just as you do. Therefore, do not kill or cause to kill. Everyone fear punishment, everyone loves life. So you do, therefore, do not kill or cause to kill. So this is from the Buddhist point of view. Him I call a Brahmin who has put aside weapons. But let us look not only from the theological perspective or from the Buddha perspective, also look at the historical perspective. Did the Buddha advise kings to abolish capital punishment? There is no evidence for us to no evidence to show that the Buddha did that. In fact, uh, the, the, the stories or the, 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 the stories uh, recorded during that time shows that many kings still were uh, going to for wars, fighting and killing others, and sentence uh, prisoners, uh, sentence uh, criminals to death sentence. But apparently there was no record to show that the Buddha advised kings not to do so. And these are some of the other uh, stories in India at that time. I will jump some of them, but some of them I will just go through to you, with you. The precious garland of advice to the king, a treatise attributed to the South Indian Buddhist philosopher Da Nagarjuna. Nagarjuna, we have to know about him because uh, he's a great proponent of Mahayana Buddhism. And his work on Buddhist state craft, Nagarjuna gives King Udayi advice on a variety of matters. And here is how Nagarjuna has handled capital punishment. Oh King, through compassion, you should always generate an attitude of help even for all those embodied beings who have committed appalling sins. Especially generate compassion for those murderers whose sins are horrible. Those of fallen nature are receptacles of compassion from those whose nature is great. Once you have analyzed the angry murderers and recognized them well, you should banish them without killing or commenting them. So he was recommending all those uh, criminals who committed murder, banish them. Actually, banish them uh, in those days means as good as go and die. Uh, give them uh, some enough food and drink and put them into the desert and they will die there. King Ashoka is likely to have retained capital punishment. If you look at the story of the third Buddhist council, before the third Buddhist council was held, there were a lot of monks who were misbehaving. And King Ashoka sent a general to investigate the case. And the general actually killed 
some of the monks. So from this story, you know that uh, Ashoka also retained capital punishment. And uh, historians generally believe that uh, during the Buddha's time, there was also capital punishment. But later part, Fasian wrote, when Fasian around uh, 1399, when he traveled to India, he, he wrote, the king of Mid Middle India governs without decapital decapitation or other corporal punishments. Criminals are simply fined, lightly or heavily, according to the circumstances. Even in cases of repeated attempts and wicked rebellion, they only have the right to hands cut off. Throughout the country, the people do not kill any living creature nor drink intoxicated liquor, nor eat onions or garlic. A Korean monk also makes a similar observation of Pasien uh, that uh, Buddhist kings in central India at that time uh, do not uh, carry out capital punishment. Therefore, we can say that probably after Ashoka's time, there was uh, abortion of capital punishment. Then, uh, this is from uh, Chinese pilgrims. Uh, the, we talk about the Ochang country, which actually now is somewhere, I think, somewhere in Xinjiang now. Also, no capital punishment. Chinese pilgrim Shen Chuang, who traveled throughout the subcontinent during the 7th century, wrote, The kings of India believed deeply in the Buddha's teaching and do not use the death penalty in governing the people. Even persons guilty of serious offenses are not executed. Japanese Emperor Shomo, a devout Buddhist, abolished capital punishment during his reign, 724 to 749, and abolished again 810, and not used for many years for the next 350 years. But today, Japan has capital punishment. So you can see the, the, the struggle trying to abolish punishment, and yet, abolish capital punishment, and yet at times have to bring back capital punishment. So today, they are out of the 10 top Buddhist countries, all maintain capital punishment except Cambodia. So you have a look at yourself, China, Thailand, Japan, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, Vietnam, South Korea, India, Malaysia, even for that matter now, if you look at Hong Kong, Taiwan, all, all have state penalties. And I know in the states, United States, some states have, some states don't have. There are people who are for abolishment. Okay. Well, because, why? Because uh, capital punishment violates the right to life and right in constitution. In most countries, constitution says that there's a liberty to life. You don't simply take away people's life. And uh, capital punishment, there's no proven deterrent effect. And it's irreversible and ultimate. It means if you, if you hang somebody, that somebody is hung and cannot seem to come back to life. It's irreversible. And what happened is uh, there are always cases of uh, judiciary mistakes or errors. So some people would have been hung for a crime not committed by them. So a fair trial is a myth. Those people who are for abolishment says a fair trial is a myth, miscarriage of justice. For example, if a person may be admitted to a crime because of torture, because of corruption, interpretation, perjury, admission of contradicting evidence, attitude of the judiciary, and so on and so forth. So there may be a miscarriage of justice at all. Therefore, the, the proponent for abolishment of capital punishment believe that it should be all, all punishment should be retroactive rather than retrospective. But people, there are also people who are against abolishment. We should maintain why? Because if the murderer already murdered somebody else, and now we are talking about protecting the murderer's life, then how about the rights of the victims? Ponder about it. In like just now the case in Taiwan, that man killed not one life but several lives, and he admitted to it. Then how about those victims' life? So in Malaysia, the same case, when we talk about abolishment, those victims' uh, families actually form organizations to protest. 
they wanted justice to be served for their for their family members that died because of murder. And of course, we talk about freedom of movement versus imprisonment. If you talk about human rights, even the restrict people's human movement or to imprison people is also human rights. Do we mean to say that uh, we should not imprison people at all? And if we abolish punishment, we are actually encouraging crime and terrorism. People who will not think twice before they commit a crime or to commit terrorism by simply killing others because they know very well they will go to, they they will, they will not be killed. And if you have a capital punishment, then you can act as a deterrent. And that is the reason why many several countries like Japan, they reinstate the capital punishment after they were faced with a, a increase in crime rates and terrorism. And they found that uh, they have to reinstate this law to act as a deterrent. Well, people say the if, if there's wrongful capital punishment is irreversible, but it's the same thing. If wrongful imprisonment is also irreversible. If he had been imprisoned for 20 years, that 20 years is gone. You can't give him back 20 years. But of course, the capital punishment is ultimate. So, of course, some people say afraid of miscarriage of justice. Then people can argue, argue back. If we are afraid of miscarriage of justice, so are we going to do away with all punishments? Because in all punishments, there is a possibility of miscarriage of justice. So why not we talk about legislative and judiciary? We still legislate the law up to the judiciary to sentence whether they, a case deserves capital punishment or otherwise. Now you talk about restorative rather than retributive. Capital punishment can be rest restorative. We take a case of Japan. There was a man, young man, just about 18 years old. When he passed by a house, there was a pregnant woman. There was a woman in the house with a small baby. He went into the house and raped that woman and killed that woman. And in the process of raping the woman, the baby came along and cried. He just took the smashed the baby on the floor and the baby also died. So he killed two lives and he admitted to it. And when just when the judge asked him why do you do that, he said, uh, well, it's just my instinct. When I saw her, I raped her. And this child was just irritating. So I smashed him and he died. And there was a big hoo-ha because he was only 18 years old and he was supposed to be kept punished. And uh, there were also some people who were on his side saying that he was just an innocent young man. He should not be punished. But eventually the court sentenced him to take penalties. But before he was sent, before the final sentence of take penalty, he was uh, happily saying that he won't die. Because he is not supposed to die because he is still under age. He is below twenty one. But if so, he was he he showed no sense of remorse. So no capital punishment. There was no restoration of him. But the moment the court sentenced him to death, and knowing that he is going to suffer capital punishment, then he felt remorseful, and he actually apologized for his wrongdoing. Though. That capital punishment actually can bring about restoration to that particular uh, perpetrator of crime. And people believe that punishment must commensurate with severity. If somebody kills somebody, then if the punishment is not the is not equivalent to killing, then it is not commensurate with the severity. So retributive is also the way to heal because by punishing the man to capital punishment for the crime of killing that he has done, then it's a way to heal, especially for the victim's uh, family. So there are again uh, many arguments uh, supporting uh, capital punishment. Well, 
Let's have some food of thought. What's the Buddha Dharma meant to solve all our social problems? Did the Buddha advise king to disband army? Devon Kion, Devon Kion is also leading the authority on Buddhism, especially on uh, ethics, Buddhist ethics. He noticed that all Buddhist countries, past and present, maintain army. And therefore, while Buddhism uh, does not advocate killing, Buddhism and Buddhist countries and Buddhist community must still maintain army as a deterrent to others. Just like you don't steal, but it's better to have your house locked when you go out. Okay? Or when house locked when you are in your house. Okay? So if, if Buddhist countries, or as uh, Damien Pion uh, argue, that uh, we must have some kind of deterrent, then uh, capital punishment as a war is also a deterrent. And we also need to ask the question, are we treating all killings the same? A terrorist killing of innocent people and uh, a punishment, capital punishment for a criminal who had committed crime, are they the same? And should Buddhists argue public policy based on solely what we believe? Do we need to take into consideration the so larger context of the society? So these are the things for food of thought. There are many, uh, many ways to look at this question now. Principle of greater good and reciprocity. People who, have, uh, who support the capital punishments, thinking of the greater good of the society. If you abolish this law, the society can be more chaotic. Okay? And then we talk about moral code and moral conscience. Moral codes like, you know, if you kill, the result is this. If you steal, the result is this. This is called moral code. But there must be con moral conscience. If we build moral conscience, then people would not do this, even though there is no code to say anything. But we would not do it because it's our moral conscience. Just like we do not speak in the open air, because we know morally that is not, not the right thing to do. So, are we going to be tied down with moral code or moral conscience? And how to atone the suffering of the victims or their family members? So, these are some of the things that uh, we need to think about when we talk about capital punishment. So, just before we conclude here about capital punishment, uh, I would like to know from you how many of you were supportive of abolishing capital punishment, but after listening to my talk, you change your mind. Or someone who, who, uh, or, or who, who was uh, uh, not supportive, but after listening to my talk, change your mind. Can I have a show of hands? Hopefully you switch on your camera now. After all, we are going to have another five minutes before we adjourn. What if I'm neither of those now? Huh? What has, if anybody, has, anyone, has anyone changed your mind after listening to the, to the talk, to, to uh, my presentation? Kind of, yes. So, oh, change from, where, from what to what? So I was against it, but... Uh, as, against what? Against abolishment? No, uh, against capital punishment, so for abolishment of it. Uh, but... <sighs> It is not my place to force my beliefs on that system is now where I stand. It's if you're going to have, you know, in the U S primarily, if you're going to have freedom of religion, I cannot force my religious beliefs of being against capital punishment based solely off of my religious beliefs. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you change your mind. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm neutral on it. So I'm neither yeah. for, right now, as I sit until I contemplate further, I'm neither for or against it. But right now, I, because I don't feel it's my place 
to force my religious beliefs on on that policy or on that yeah that's a wise move <laughs> in, in buddhism we always say that if we are not sure we postpone judgment first yeah yeah until we get more information anybody else i'm with the oh. quarry neutral building on Corey's. oh sorry oh uh, neutral now well this is a debatable issue so we keep on debating I would just chime in real quick and build on Corey's thing that uh, we're allowed these social issues because it just doesn't seem like they're going to be solved anytime soon. That's an opinion. So um, I, I like to be for pro compassion and uh, instead of what oh, wow. against. Yes. And no, then well, you, for pro well, compassion. So, so the, the, well, the, compassion. The, the thing is, this isn't going to be solved, I don't think, easily. The answer I feel is. Um, consciousness development so if people develop their own consciousness and um and since we're all interrelated and interconnected what we do to develop our consciousness and give compassion to ourselves and others since we're all interconnected that has a ripple effect um so that's that's the way i look at it this is um a consciousness issue and a spiritual issue more than a, a social issue same thing with the hot button topics most of the hot button topics that divide people like abortion and et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. And here's the problem with sitting on the fence. If you sit on the fence, then you become a um, more of an active participant in the death of innocent people. The Innocence Project has exonerated death row inmates hundreds of times. If they would have been put to death, it would have been an innocent man dying. So I don't understand how you can sit on the fence when you become complicit in the deaths of innocent people. Well, you have, you, you, thanks, thank you for your opinion. You look like you have a very strong opinion here. <laughs> Lee is attorney. Huh? Yes. Lee is attorney. <laughs> oh, I see, I see. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I know personally people who have been exonerated after spending decades in prison because the trial was a farce. Mm. They were represented by a public defender that didn't really care. But anyway, that's yeah, just my opinion. For the Innocence yeah. Project. Yeah, yeah. Actually, actually, in my country, the main argument also was uh, on the judiciary uh, errors that uh, once we commit that errors and we commit, we send somebody to to, to be hung, uh, it is a great injustice. So that was the main argument. Well, Lee, like I said, currently until I contemplate on it more, I I was against capital punishment, but yeah, wait, in light of new perspective and information, I I cannot say I'm neither for or against it until I. I meditate on it more. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. Yep, I get it. Yeah. I, I, I know I, I know you're coming from Tuli because I think the same thing about like health insurance and like universal health care and how like in our country right now, you know, potentially millions and millions of Americans are going to lose their health insurance coming up here soon if they try to overturn Obamacare. And in a similar light, I think to myself, how could you not be for the support of universal health care knowing that you're basically sentencing, sentencing so many of those people to death who are just not going to have health insurance or be able to make those payments or be able to get the treatment they need. You know who won't lose their health care? Politicians. Exactly. <laughs> That's the problem. Yeah. There, yeah. Therein lies the problem. Yep. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, so the time is up. So our time management is good. We cover all the topics. Uh, we had uh, done our revision, so just wait for your mock exam. So probably we see you again during the mock examination, and we can call it a day today. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.